Hi, I'm Chris. Hi, I'm Robert. And we're the Film Flamers, a monthly podcast devoted to all things horror. Well, horror and film at least. And horror adjacent. Horror adjacent. Yeah. With a little bit of glitter thrown in. (laughs) Guys, we are in October, and we are dead set in the middle of fall. Leaves are changing, temperatures are getting cooler... Well, we're in the South, so uh, it doesn't really get cold until like the middle of January. Yeah, I was going to say, why am I still sweating like some kind of farm animal? Just wait to get your Halloween costume on. My God, you'll be sweating like a pig. Uh Uh-huh. This is the time of year that we horror fans gather together to celebrate our love of all things horror. We can watch as many horror movies as we want without repercussions of people asking things like, why do you watch that shit? Exactly. Mm -hmm. And uh, what better movie to talk about in October than Trick or Treat? Uh, I love this movie. I think that we discovered this movie around the same time, I think. Yeah, there was a lot of buzz around it because like, it took a while for it to come out. Like, It was on the film uh, festival circuit for like two years or something, and they kept pushing it back. And finally, it was just like a direct-to-Blu-ray release, but it got such good reviews and good buzz and critical acclaim and really quickly became a cult classic, or at least had a cult following. The buzz was there. The trailers were good. I just I don't know how I ended up watching it, but I just did, and I loved it. I know how I ended up watching it because uh, this was back in the time of like well, the last days of Blockbuster and I was perusing the shelves and I saw it on the new release wall and I was like well what is this I had never heard of this movie before and I just randomly watched it one night and then I watched it again the very next day and we were having a conversation back when we first became friends and somehow it came up and we just had this little fangirl moment together and so I mean I think it was one of our first conversations about horror movies actually yeah and were you okay like exiting that blockbuster or did you have to like trip over a, a tumbleweed or something well let's not forget that i worked for blockbuster for 10 years <laughs> and so when i walk into one i expect fanfare no matter what i know there's some blockbusters still in existence in the world and if i go into it i expect my picture to be on the wall in some sort of hall of fame i think there's just one i think there's just one left in alaska oh is it i think so they have like the best twitter thing i don't know oh, okay. it's funny Well, Trick or Treat is a 2007 anthology dark horror comedy film written and directed by Michael Doherty and produced by none other than Brian Singer behind, like, the X-Men franchise and Apt Pupil, which no one else has seen. (laughs) I don't know why I said Apt Pupil. Um, The Usual Suspects uh, was his first big one. Mm -hmm. Um, He's done a lot. Well, and he's a good member of our gay community, I think. Well, I think he identifies as bi. Yeah, he's gotten into some trouble recently oh, with yeah. the whole Me Too movement. But I, or was it Me Too that he got in trouble with? Well, or? let's just say he has a proclivity. Okay, well, uh, anyway, this was not directed by him. This was directed by Michael Doherty. And, of course, he is the same director that did Krampus mm-hmm. uh, just recently. And coming out right now, Godzilla, King of the Monsters. Which I, I mean, I haven't seen the trailer yet. I know everyone has, but I... I'm always on the fence about Godzilla. The trailer is amazing, but the trailer was amazing for the last Godzilla movie that came out, and the movie was just like, meh. Wah, wah. Yeah, the trailer is amazing for this one. It uses, like, Claire de Lune with, like, a chorus behind Anyway, we're not talking about our movie. So, yeah, uh, but this this movie, Trick or Treat, there, there's a reason we've chosen this, obviously. I mean, it's obviously a Halloween movie, but that's not the only reason. It's a love letter to Halloween. It lives and breathes Halloween. The, the, its palette is orange. It's, it's just, it's all about Halloween, the traditions and the rules and everything else around it and uh, that's that's why we picked it well and for me personally like this movie features my three favorite subgenre of horror number one my favorite subgenre is Halloween horror or holiday horror Christmas Thanksgiving Halloween Mother's Day Arbor Day I don't care secondly I love anthology movies and I like zombies so what's not to love about this yes and it's not just any anthology movie because this uh, collection of stories they actually intersect and you can see it all throughout the movie, especially there's just a, such a bonus with rewatching this film because you can see all of the other kind of stories in the background happening. Well, before we get too deep into it, ladies and gentlemen, this is Trick or Treat. During the spookiest time of the year, there are a few guidelines all ghosts and goblins should follow. Always stay on sidewalks. Never go to a stranger's house. And never go out below. This is the one 
night. Then all sorts of things. Roam free. Sorry. All these traditions. Wait, wait. What? You're supposed to keep it lit. Why? Ain't you tradition? Putting on costumes. I look like I'm five. You look great. What did we do now? We meet our days. Jack o' lanterns. Why are we here? To pay our respects to the dead? The Halloween school bus massacre. They started to protect us, but. Morning, guys. How are you doing down there? Hiding bodies? <laughs> Nowadays, no one really cares. This one's the lit. What is that? It's them. Oh my god. Look at me. It's not a trick. It's real. Tonight, it's about respecting the customs, not breaking them. Trick or Treat is set in Warren Valley, Ohio, a town that wildly celebrates Halloween. The anthology includes five tales that intersect over the course of one Halloween night, all being observed by Sam, a small child dressed in a onesie and wearing a burlap mask, who seems to appear whenever a Halloween rule or tradition is broken. First, a married couple, Emma, played by Leslie Bibb, and Henry, played by Tom O'Pennicott, return home from a night of partying, both a little tired and drunk. Exasperated by the evening, Emma attempts to blow out the jack-o'-lantern outside the elaborately decorated lawn. Henry objects, citing the tradition of keeping it lit to protect you on Halloween. Unable to be persuaded, Emma extinguishes it while being watched across the street. While Henry goes inside to prepare for their maritals, Emma angrily begins to dismantle the Halloween setup in the yard, becoming frightened by a neighborhood teen. Feeling foolish for being so scared, she pulls down a decoration and is attacked by an unseen assailant, leaving Henry to discover her mutilated and dismembered body on display as a decoration. Earlier that night, a neighborhood terrorist, Charlie, a fat, destructive child, has spent his evening devouring candy and destroying jack-o'-lanterns. He comes across a house with a bowl of candy displayed and begins to steal it all. He is caught in the act by his school principal, Stephen Wilkins, played by Dylan Baker, who owns the home and promptly sits the boy down to lecture him on the rules and traditions of Halloween, telling the boy, these traditions were meant to protect us. During the conversation, Charlie begins to feel sick and vomits spectacularly all the chocolate he's been eating, uh, the apparent victim of candy poisoning, at the hand of Principal Wilkins himself. Pulling the corpse inside for disposal, Wilkins is set back by a barrage of nuisances. A group of trick-or-treaters rings his bell and asks for a pumpkin, more on them later. His crotchety neighbor, Mr. Krieg, taunts him from next door, more on him later too. And finally, Wilkins' own son screaming at him from the upstairs window asking to carve a jack-o'-lantern. After burying the body in the backyard, Wilkins goes inside, angry at his son for being so disruptive. He grabs the knife and follows his son to the basement to carve the pumpkin, all the while his son asking for help with carving the eyes. Together in the basement, it is revealed that the pumpkin they are carving together is none other than Charlie's severed head. One less child neighborhood terrorist to deal with, I guess. Elsewhere, the group of kids at Wilkins' door, Macy, Sarah, Chip, and Schrader, have been collecting jack-o'-lanterns and meet Rhonda, a special needs Halloween enthusiast said to be a savant, who they take along with them. They bring their collected jack-o'-lanterns to an old quarry where mean girl Macy tells the other kids of the Halloween school bus massacre, a local legend about a bus driver who attempts to murder special needs children at the behest of their parents, only to be nearly killed himself. Macy explains that leaving a pumpkin for each of the child victims acts as a tribute. However, this all seems to be a ruse as the kids pull a prank on the savant, Rhonda, terrifying her enough to cause her to fall backwards into a ditch and injure herself. Afraid that they went too far, the kids decide to leave, but before they can, Macy kicks one of the lit pumpkins into the water, causing the dead school bus children to rise as zombies. The kids try to flee, but they find Rhonda, the savant, holding a lit jack-o'-lantern for safety, locked alone in the quarry elevator, their only escape. Rhonda rises to safety, leaving her pranksters pleading for help as they are murdered and ripped apart by the zombie children below. Rhonda passes Sam, the burlap mask wearing child, as she walks back home from the quarry, resigned to the deaths of the other kids. 
Later, a group of college-aged women have arrived in town to celebrate their own tradition, picking up men to take to a party. Inexperienced, Lori, played by Anna Paquin, is nervous and shy, but determined to find her own date for the first time without the help of her older sister, Danielle. The group join the street party, where a masked man is stalking, seducing, and killing women with his vampire-like fangs. Lori catches the attention of the masked killer, who follows her into the woods, where the party will be taking place. The other women, already at the party, hear the screams of Lori being attacked in the woods. When a body wearing Lori's costume falls out of the trees, they fear the worst. However, the victim is the masked killer, who is revealed to be Principal Wilkins wearing fake vampire fangs. Lori enters the party, slightly injured but alive, and proclaims that Wilkins is her date. The women begin to dance around a fire, slowly transforming into werewolves, devouring their dates and completing their Halloween tradition. Sam, the burlap mask-wearing child, watches the festivities. Earlier in the evening, crotchety Mr. Krieg, played by Brian Cox, is spending his Halloween terrorizing the neighborhood children who ring his bell. We don't know if he hates Halloween, hates kids, or both. Later, hearing noises and investigating what his dog's barking at, he goes outside to his backyard to take a look, only to discover his neighbor, Principal Wilkins, making noises in his own backyard. After a fairly salty exchange, Mr. Krieg goes back inside. He hears noises again on the other side of the house and discovers that his entire front yard has been decorated with hanging jack-o'-lanterns. Going back inside, he soon discovers that Sam, the onesie and burlap mask-wearing child, has invaded his home and is attempting to attack and terrorize him. Sam attacks Krieg, who unmasks him, revealing Sam to be a demonic, pumpkin-headed child. About to kill Krieg, Sam notices a piece of Halloween candy on Krieg's chest that had fallen there during the struggle. Sam takes it and eats it. Appeased, he leaves Krieg alone, satisfied that Krieg has offered him candy. Meanwhile, pictures burning in the fireplace reveal Krieg to be none other than the bus driver who was responsible for the deaths of the special needs children from the earlier story. Later, having learned his lesson, a beaten and bandaged Krieg is seen passing out candy to trick-or-treaters and sees Sam watching the married couple argue about blowing out the jack-o'-lantern from the opening scene of the film. Krieg goes back inside, leaving the couple to learn their own lesson about Halloween. But his doorbell rings again, only to open the door to the zombie children from the school bus massacre, who have arrived to exact their revenge. The end. Is that what happened? Like we said, Trick or Treat was filmed in 2007, but it sat on the shelves till 2009, when it was released on DVD. In between then, it had some festival screenings and really gained a cult following. And people clamored for it, for, for at least a, a theatrical release or a DVD release. And like a lot of the good stories, um, I feel like the directors like know what they want to do or the storytellers know what they want to do years in advance before they ever make the film, right? A lot of films are like that, I think. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I know that uh, this director, Michael Doherty, has an affinity for Halloween. He's almost obsessed with it. Well, I think as a student, I think the short that's actually included on the as a bonus content on the, the Blu-ray, the short's called Season's Greetings. And it's actually the first appearance of Sam, who is, I, I guess, uh, implied to be the spirit of Halloween, right? Uh, Sam meaning Sam Hain or Sawin. So, of course, we say Sam and not Saw. Yeah, not a good character, Saw. No, but he's a great character. And I, I can see him being in a lot of like sequels or anthologies or something and – well, he's super iconic already. I mean, there's so many like figurines you can buy of him. And I know that like they were making these like small toys, these collectibles before mm -hmm. the movie was even released on DVD. Yeah. And, and actually we'll, we'll, uh, we'll put a link to it in the show notes. Uh, the movie itself was made on a budget of 12 million dollars. And to me, this movie looks like it was made on so much more than that. Yes. I, I it's obviously, it, it looks like it's a big budget or at least like an official, like budgeted studio Halloween film, but it's done with so, so much more loving care than like a normal, just like run of the mill Halloween, churn it out studio film that it's different. And I think that's why I was so surprised the first time I watched this movie. I, I ran it on a whim and I was expecting something I'd never heard of, some sort of straight to video release to be, you know, just crap really and watching it i'm like oh my god this movie is this is a big budget movie yeah and then finding out how much it was actually made on just like it shocks me to my my core how much was it 12 million dollars yeah yeah and uh, they, they got a lot of good like brian cox is is no slouch he's been in a lot of like, he was big... the first hannibal lecter i mean my god yeah he's been in a lot of big like troy he was uh he was in like the x-men 2 i mean but of well, course and that's the thing right there is that like half these people in this movie were somehow related to to x-men right yeah like, when brian singer had atta been attached anna right. paquin of anna course paquin. played rogue 
And I know that like James Marston has a a, a a vocal cameo in the movie. Oh, really? He played Cyclops, right, in X Men. Huh. And I mean, and other than that, uh, half the the crew also worked on Battlestar Galactica. Uh-huh. And so they, I mean, this this combined love of like X Men, Battlestar Galactica came to make this fantastic twelve million dollar budget horror movie. Yeah, and it's so it was. I just remember just instantly falling in love with it. As soon as you see that, that palette and just all of the, the jack o' lanterns everywhere and the, the town itself is in love with Halloween. Right. And so it's super, super easy to like understand. Like everyone's super excited. Everyone wants to be a part of this. Well, it makes you feel like fall. As soon as you watch it, there's leaves everywhere, right? You can hear the leaves crunching as they walk. Everyone, everyone you see is in a costume for the most part. And it just really like just signifies exactly what Halloween is. And I think that's exactly what he wanted to do when he made this movie. And there's a really big emphasis on Halloween itself as far as the traditions themselves, not just the holiday or the feel and look of it. It's really about what are these traditions and why were they created? And a lot of this is a little bit in the mythology of the film itself uh, rather than like the real world, you know. But, you know, they, they, they say like the trick or treating, you know, you're putting out gifts or like basically offerings for the dead spirits so they don't right. attack you. Kind of like this is, this is an old concept, you know, mm-hmm. uh, folk, you know, folklore concept. But, uh, you know, to protect you basically from those evil spirits. And of course, that's the whole where trick or treating and all that stuff came from theoretically. And, and what these, what they're doing is, of course, they're, they've also brought in some of the newer, uh, rules, which is check your candy, kids, right. <laughs> cause you might be chewing on a razor blade. <laughs> Well, I mean, and, and all that stuff is like actually like based in real life. I mean, there are some serial killers who did that sort of thing. There was a man who poisoned his own children just to collect uh, insurance money. And that's where we sort of get that thing from. Yeah. And if you know what, if you're going to not check your candy, just don't go to my front door and barf spectacularly like this kid in this movie did. That fucking that's barf just... was amazing. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't like stand by me barf or anything, but it no, was. No, I mean, uh, it's not blueberry. It was, but... Yeah, it was much more disgusting. I, I mean, I know that that the vomit in this movie was mostly like caro syrup and like chocolate syrup mixed together and so it must have tasted just fantastic oh gross (laughs) oh you disagree (laughs) (laughs) i really enjoy how this movie like intertwines the old traditions and the new ones things like check your candy but also like you know Halloween is a time to like be your different self or your inner self. And so you find people getting costumes that either represent who they are or who they want to be, like their sexiest self and things like that. But it also shows you how you can change your views on Halloween throughout your lifetime. You can start Halloween as a child and really enjoy it, move into a young adult and try to be someone sexy or adventurous, and then end up like Mr. Creek and just be some crotchety man who doesn't even want to pass out candy. This movie is so hard to talk about because it's it's non-linear, right? Yeah, I mean, it goes like, back and forth. Uh, the beginning of the movie kind of happens near the, more near the end because they're coming back from the night of partying. You also see the the girls come up, you know, in the, their car, and their her. I, I double checked Anna Paquin's hair is all down and messed up, so it was after that whole thing had happened, right. and they stop for um, for the savants' uh, cart of jack o' lantern, you know, to go across the road, you know. So you see like all these stories intersecting a lot, and. Uh, even the main characters that aren't in any story, you can kind of gauge the time by by seeing like the three clown trick or treaters in the background of where they are. Um, you can even see at the beginning of the film the zombie children going up to his door at the beginning. That's right. I mean, so the entire movie like presents itself to you from start to finish, and it reminds you exactly what has already happened and what hasn't. The hard part when watching this, and I assume for, well, for some people who are not used to watching a movie like that, is that the, the timeline seems so weird. It's like watching Pulp Fiction for the first time. Well, and it's not like Shutter Island where it's like a different movie the next time you watch it. It's like completely different once you know. But it's a, it's a little bit like that in places, but mostly it's, it's just that way because it's like a treasure trove of finding all of these little things in the background that were happening in other shots. That's true. And it's, it's kind of meticulously made in that sense. Because it's just you, every time I watch it, I see something new. I had heard that the original version of this movie, the way that it was written and the way that it was filmed, it was supposed to be a straightforward on anthology where every story has a, a definite start and an end. So now that we've talked about the like intersections of all these stories, let's dive a little bit deeper into the stories themselves. Yeah, I think, I mean, really the only way to talk about this movie practically is to start from the beginning and just move story by story through it. Yeah. 
And uh, it is important to note that they intersect, but I, I still think that we need to dive in and, and just really look at the homages and uh, and some of the call outs from the stories themselves. I mean, because this movie really is a horror movie and Halloween lovers wet dream. So let's yeah get started. So the the first story, of course, is the what the film opens to, which is the uh, the wife and husband or whatever, where the wife hates Halloween and, and she wants to take all the decorations down and like he goes back inside. Do you think she really hates Halloween or she just hates the fact that he put her in a fucking box? So she literally says, I hate Halloween. Oh, what a yeah. bitch. Yeah. So I feel like Sam, like re- that really got, got his attention. Oh, yeah. You know? He was going to do it for me. Okay. Yeah. So uh, she's before she's attacked by Sam or the unseen assailant from our synopsis. Um, she actually sees this kid in a mask across the street, just standing there. And it looks like he's staring at her. And mm-hmm. this is a direct homage to John Carpenter's Halloween. Right. Cause Laurie Strode walking down the street, turns around and sees Michael Myers just standing there. Right. And yeah. then he's gone the next instant. And then yeah. down, uh, by the laundry or whatever, when she looks down the window and stuff, he's staring. There's a couple <laughs> of scenes where he's standing, standing by the hedge, standing mm-hmm. across the street, right. uh, driving by the car, like all that stuff where it's just kind of staring. And, you know, the first time I saw this movie, I was just like, oh, God, I was just like, this is what it's going to be. She's going to be attacked by the person watching her from across the street. And then when you get that little joke payoff of he's just waiting for his friends, like being a creep. Right. And I'm like, OK, yeah. good, because mm-hmm. everything that comes after that is is a shocking surprise. Yeah. And I really like the fact that she's she's pulling down those decorations, those sheets, and they're making that loud noise. And you know that something is going to be underneath one of those sheets. Yeah. And I mean, you get that payoff. Off. And I also like in this that you don't really see Sam at all. So you have no idea who's attacking her. You know it's kind of a smaller person or a smaller figure. Uh-huh. But, I mean, you don't know who the villain is. Yeah, not quite yet. And you don't really realize it's the little kid, especially on the first watch. Like, you don't know. Right. But you can hear – you can actually hear him kind of like a child kind of grunting and stuff. Do you know that the the kid who plays him, they, they cast an actual little boy and they were so blown away by his uh, audition that they, they cast him in this. They – his parents allowed him to be put in all these prosthetics and things like that. And he, they're just so enamored of his performance in this movie that they gave him a role without his mask on just because they wanted to be, him to be featured in the movie. So later on in the werewolf sequence, he's the little boy that's peeping in the dressing room. Oh, really? Yeah. He's a, he's an amazing little I kid. I was going to like crap myself if you had said it was the, the Chucky, like the son of, uh, oh, Wilkins. Yeah. Wilkins. Yeah. Well, and that, that little boy's so cute too. I've seen him in other shit, but, yeah. um, so I mean, when she gets attacked by him and <clears throat> her husband wakes up, you know, still ready for their maritals, I guess. And who falls asleep to porn? I don't understand. You have to be so drunk to not like, yeah. um, when he comes out and he discovers her body mutilated, dismembered yeah. throughout the yard, that's like one of these new Halloween urban legends, right? That people are driving by these elaborately decorated Halloween yards and in actuality, it's an, a real corpse. Yeah. Right? And her arms and legs, like she had already taken down like the fake arm, bloody right. arms and legs from the trees mm-hmm. and he sees them, but they're not, he looks at the box and they're already in the box. And then he looks there and he sees like the real blood dripping and everything. And before he kind of like, like gets it, he turns around cause he, he, the light turns on under the sheet of the, one of the, the sheet monsters or whatever that are the sheet ghosts that are standing in the yard. Right. And then he pulls it down. That's when he sees her like severed head with a big fucking lollipop. lollipop. In it. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. That's the best murder weapon ever. And didn't, he, uh, weren't some kids like walking down the street when he was killing her and they like got freaked out and ran the other way and he yeah. drags her body back. Into she was the yard. under the sheet cause she was pulling that sheet off. And then like the sheet covered her with the cat. And then like they see the bloods. So they're like, what the hell's going on? Like they yeah. think that's like maybe like a, a little play that a neighbor's putting on for them or something. But then they see the blood splatter and like the real screams and then they just like they run away. And I think it's those. I mean, I think I mean, we've already talked about call outs throughout the movie. But I think that the kids who see her are those three clowns yes. that keep popping up all yeah. the time. Right. Yeah. Yeah. This movie's so fucking good. Uh, I mean, it's a really good start to the movie. I think it sets up a lot. I think it gives you all these expectations that really don't even follow through because everything that comes after this is just – it turns into a different kind of horror movie and every story progresses that way. Yeah. And it's a really good segue into the next story. So uh, in the next story, the first thing that we see is uh, you know Charlie knocking down jack-o'-lanterns, just sort of terrorizing a town. And you, I mean I sort of got the idea that the story was going to be about him or – you know. 
something that is going to befall him, and that's exactly what happens. Of course, yeah. yeah. There's a lot of laser-guided karma in this movie. Yeah, because you can't <laughs> do shit like that and not get some sort of comeuppance. Especially when, you know, the, the spirit of Halloween is an actual character in the film. <laughs> exactly. I mean, you just got to be on your fucking guard. But uh, when he goes to steal that candy and his principal catches him and he turns around and you, you get to see what his costume is like this kid is really just terrible yeah like he's going stealing candy knocking off jack-o'-lanterns and the only thing that he has that's a costume is a shirt that says this is my costume and i'm like motherfucker i mean this is terrible yeah yeah so well he gets what, what's coming to him of course no no child deserves to die but you know this one uh well, you don't there really are so much many for. dead children in this movie it's it's unreal to me how yeah. how they made this movie and killed so many children mm-hmm. uh but it also it, sets up principal wilkins as like this nefarious kind of like sinister because he goes through this whole lecture about like the rules of and traditions of halloween it's like these rules were set up to protect us and you know one of the newer rules you know always check your candy and that's when the kid candy. like starts barfing and and you know obviously he'd eaten get some poison or like razor or swallowed some razors and in, in the candy or whatever i think it was it was poison, yeah, right? It must have been. He, whenever he walks inside, you see that set up on the table, and there's, like, different poisons. Oh. And there's, like, a half-dissected uh, candy bar where he's sticking, like, m- like razors into it as well. So he's he's killing kids, like, at random, I think. And later on in the movie, we see Sam. Sam gets a piece of candy from him. Well, how would you check your candy if it's poisoned, though? You I can't. Mean, I mean, there's a um, – this is a little off topic, but I'm going to talk about it anyway. There is a killer from uh, Houston, Texas called the candy man it's what started this whole check your candy craze and he his children died after eating poisoned pixie sticks this is back in the 70s what? yeah and and so he was like on tv like someone murdered my children and this whole national craze of Ch- check your candy started and as it turns out he poisoned his own children he poisoned those pixie sticks yeah he, and yeah. yeah yeah it turns out a lot of that happens on mm-hmm. halloween when that does happen it's usually a family member exactly like and an so, aunt or an uncle or a mother or a father that's that's poisoning their own kids essentially. But what's so terrifying is that, I mean, people could actually be doing this like principal Wilkins is. And, um, you find out just the extent of Principal Wilkins's, uh, you know, effects later on because Sam shows up at his door trick or treating and he snatches a candy bar out of the, the bucket. And later on, he uses that same candy bar to attack Mr. Krieg. Yeah. Uh, this story to me is good because it, it reminds you that it's okay to laugh in a horror movie, that not everything has to be so serious. Yeah. Because everything that happens, including that massive puke sequence, which is hilarious, yeah, uh, is sure. just funny, funny, funny. His child screaming from upstairs. I mean, I've almost never laughed so hard in a horror movie when he calls Charlie Brown an asshole. I just... <laughs> Go watch Charlie Brown. Charlie Brown's an asshole. <laughs> Shh, quiet. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's like, language. <laughs> While he's burying a child in his yard. <laughs> like, yeah. The, yeah. The whole thing is is just like really kind of casual and lighthearted. And that's part of his shtick. And that's part right. of the story's shtick. But there's also bait and switch a little bit in this one. Just like... Actually, there's a bait and switch in every single story. Oh, yeah. Like the bait and switch with Michael Myers... Um, look alike or whatever, and the mm-hmm. the first one with the wife and husband, and in this one bait and switch where you think he's going to kill his own kid. Right, like they, he keeps saying the kid keeps asking, "Help me with the eyes, with the jack o' lantern. Help me carve the jack o' lantern." Uh-huh. And he goes down, and he's like, he's already kind of upset with his kid for being annoying and yelling out yeah, the window. He's, he's, he's trying like, to bury Daddy, a body. I wish mommy were still alive. And I'm like, did he kill his wife? You know, yeah, I'm just uh, like <laughs> there was multiple bodies in that hole, <laughs> right. you know, and then like because I thought he was burying the body of Charlie, but it wasn't Charlie because that it was one of the clown kids or whatever. Right. Well, I mean, Charlie was in there because it was his arm with yeah. the the clown, the clown costume. costume. Yeah, I'm like sure that, Charlie's right. body was. But you, you go in and, and you go. To, he goes downstairs into the basement and he's following his kid with a knife. Right. And he's like, uh, "Let's do a less scary one this time." And he's then the, scary the dad face is like, is. "The dad takes this really long. It takes like a good like." 15 seconds like for him to like stare down really seriously like right. he's gonna stab like, his son in the head the tension. and then you hear it like it is gross sound and then you look around and lo and behold it's charlie's head charlie's head and that the father and son are carving together and it's gross and that's what i think i mean because you have this whole story that's mostly comedic and then you you get to the end and that that punchline is just the fucking horror of it all yeah that he is like training his son to take over as a killer himself. Mm-hmm. And he he talks about his grandfather at a certain point. Like we're going to make caramel apples just like grandpa used to make. And you can just sort of get the idea that this is what this family does. And later on at the end of the movie, you see his son, Principal Wilkins' son, 
dressed as Principal Wilkins. That's his costume. He's sitting on the <laughs> porch wearing a bloody shirt and tie, passing out candy to other kids. And so he's continuing this constantly. And That's just, true. I actually hadn't noticed that before. Yeah. At the end, he's dressed as his dad. He has taken at over the for beginning, his father. At the beginning, he's dressed as Chucky. <laughs> so, I mean, I just I, I like this story, too. I think it was a, a great way to follow the, the murder of the, the wife in the first one. Yeah. And it just shows you that this movie is going to be both fun and terrifying. Yeah. What's the next story? The next story is the kids, right? Yeah, the next story is the school bus Halloween school bus massacre. Yeah, it sounds like something out of Kill Bill. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I I mean I like this story a lot too. What I think I like the most about this one is it's a complete peanuts homage that uh, Michael Doherty said that he he wanted to to do a great pumpkin and he originally um named these children after peanuts characters and the studio said no we're not going to do that and he changed them slightly to something else yeah and i mean like so these kids are out doing their own halloween thing and they're going to prank this special needs girl yeah because of course they're it's like well, wh- what sadistic mind came up with this plan too it's like my prank? fucking spirit animal that Don't... little girl is my spirit animal she's such a bitch the, the mean girl yes uh, macy i love her to death i hate her like, i love her so much well it's like okay but if you, if the whole massacre was on special needs kids right why are you gonna take like the only special key- needs kid you know out there and scare the, the shit out of him about well, it because her pranks are literal I don't know. Yeah. It's like, okay. Whatever. I just love that she's such a bitch and she's dressed as an angel. And it's just like, yeah. I love it. Um, I like this story a lot too, because it's also really funny when they go to that woman's house to get a jack-o'-lantern and they're having that adult like sex party Halloween thing going on. In yeah. The back. It's their teachers. Yeah. yeah and the, the chip is like, they're like, what even was that? And he was like, that was coach Taylor in a hot dog costume, but fucking a pig. <laughs> let's, just like, let's just not. Let's just <laughs> let's not. not. <laughs> yeah. But the, it's also a call out here because they're like, we can't find all the jack-o'-lanterns we need. Someone's been smashing them. Of exactly. course, call out to right. Charlie from mm-hmm. the beginning. He was now throwing up all over himself. And of course they get to Rhonda's house and there's just jack-o'-lanterns everywhere yeah because she's uh theoretically she's the quote-unquote savant that is she loves halloween yeah doing Mm -hmm. all this stuff with the jack-o'-lantern she knows all the history she was a good little actress too where she's talking to chip and she's like talking about salwain and like you know halloween's origins and he's just like what and she's like oh i like your eye patch i mean it's just like there's good writing in this movie and good performances especially from such small children yeah and, uh, you know, they go and it's actually a very effective, like, set piece, too. Like, oh, yeah. The Corey is really good looking. Like, and then the and then the kids get in costumes to try and scare her and their costumes look fairly legit. Mm-hmm. I love it when they when they do kind of a bait and switch that way because it's like, oh, like that, those are scary. But it's like, eh. but then the real zombies come and kill, you know, them after they've done their trick on Rhonda. And uh, she escapes or whatever, and they look really legit. Like they, they look do. scary. Like, I mean, I yeah, I, especially I, the one with like the bag, the bag costume one that was super short. Yeah, that's terrifying. Whatever. Anyway, oh my god, because it looks like his skin, it looks like his head, and it's like boxy and weird. And yeah. uh, that okay, so the flashback sequence in this story where they talk about the the massacre of these children on the school bus, and is, of course, there's a big orange filter on that whole. Oh yeah, flashback. it's all sepia toned, yeah. but it looks beautiful i mean this movie is it they they made that so well and i know that this movie was shot in vancouver and they 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 went up there in november thinking it was going to be really fall and be the perfect setting right but it was actually like snowy and rainy the whole time and they were shooting that sequence one day and it was just pouring down rain and they were going to scrap the entire day shooting um because they really they really wanted like this like heavenly light to sort of shine on it and they're just about to scrap it and the rain stopped and the clouds opened up and the like ray of sunshine shot on that bus and they were like perfect let's do it so yeah. it was all kismet and i mean it's just a really effective flashback sequence yeah it was really good it's beautiful I and old timey costumes like that are they're always the scary. Yeah, they're always the scariest. That bag with a little mouth drawn on it. I'm like, if some kid showed up at my door wearing that, I'd be like, no fucking candy for you, you creep. Get, a- yeah. get away. You can't even eat it. <laughs> <laughs> it was a cutout from a magazine, like serial killer style. It was. Oh, yeah, yeah it's just horrifying to me. I, uh, um, I, I do like the zombies in that movie. because I, I think I've already said before in this recording that this movie features my three favorite subgenre and zombie is right up there with it. So I'm glad that they threw that in there. Yeah. 
Totally. And of course, we get more Halloween traditions because uh, the zombies come out of the water after Macy kicks a lit pumpkin, extinguishing it, yep. which sort of destroys them at that point. And of course, we find that Sam was probably there, like looking over the edge of the quarry. Oh, yeah, because we see time. him when Rhonda escapes with her lit pumpkin. I mean, she's smart. Yeah, it's almost another bait and switch that she doesn't let them in the elevator to save them. Like, she's like, nope, this is my revenge. And would you, though? Yeah. I mean, like. And then she pushes, she, you think she's going to unlock the, the gate for them to get mm-hmm. into the elevator, the quarry elevator, and then she just pushes the button. And they're like, no. Yep. And, uh, you know, because at the end of the day, you feel bad for, like, the little kid. You feel bad for maybe the girl with a retainer. And you might feel really bad for the, the kid that was actually concerned for her. But they, at the end of the day, they all participated in this prank against exactly. her. And so she just goes up the elevator. You can hear them just being ripped apart. Mm-hmm. And uh, she goes up there and she sees Sam just, like, dragging and going towards the quarry. And oh, she's yeah. walking like, away. What up? Yeah. They just <laughs> That's it. Exchange nods and or whatever. <laughs> and they just go on their, their happy little way. Uh, I mean, I again, it's a, a a great story. I think the characters in that are, are fantastic, and I I really wish that that mean girl would have lived because if there's ever a sequel to this movie, I just want to see what she's doing when she gets to high school because I bet that she would just like fucking terrorize Carrie or something. She's just <laughs> one of those kind of girls, and I love her. Yeah. Mm. So the next story is the werewolves. werewolves. Yeah, and. Uh, of course, I'm a I'm a fan of Anna Paquin. She's no slouch in horror or horror adjacent. Oh either. no, yeah. I mean, True Blood. Come on. Yeah, True Blood. And of course, she was an X Man, and mm-hmm. uh, she won. What? She was one of the youngest. She was the second youngest uh, recipient of a Academy, Academy Award, Award ever for the, piano. for the piano with Helen. I remember that acceptance speech. <laughs> I almost said Helen Hunt. Um, Holly Hunter. Holly Hunter. Yeah. yeah. Thank God it wasn't Helen Hunt. <laughs> um, so I, this 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 story is good because it really gives you a sort of modern day take on Halloween. This is what we see a lot these days. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are less scary costumes, and it's always like who can be the sluttiest. Yeah, and and at the beginning they're all talking or whatever in the Halloween costume, and they're trying to like, they're trying to figure out what they're going to wear and how they look and what they do right. and, and and how much fun they're going to have. But the conversation has a completely different meaning the next oh, yeah. time you see because they're talking about, uh, they're talking about like eating people. They're literally like and and what they're doing and 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 they're past doing that. And it sounds like they're just planning a party and that they they'd gotten like the girls that had gotten sick because they ate bad Mexican or whatever. But mm-hmm. later she says. You know, like the way she says it, you could tell it's just it could be equally about she literally ate, a, you know, a person, a Mexican person. <laughs> and it made her sick. I mean, yeah, the, the double entendre in that conversation is just fantastic. And I mean, it tells you exactly what's going to happen. But you also don't really know, like you, you, there's a lot of calls that you just go over. It was really cleverly written it because is. it's like she's like, I look stupid. I look like a five year old. And she's dressed as Little Red Riding Hood mm-hmm. for the irony of it. And right. She's a fucking wolf. And yeah. then they tell her it's tradition. It doesn't matter how you look. Mm-hmm. And that should have been like a little bit of a, a foreshadowing there. But there's a lot of foreshadowing in that scene. But it was just so cleverly, subtly written that you wouldn't know the first time you watch it. I think one of my favorite lines from that entire conversation is like, well, we were in San Diego and we were dressed as sailors and we ended up as sailors. And like, yeah, but Maria's turned out to be a girl. And she was just like, I don't care. Like, all ass tastes the same to me. I mean, she's talking about eating an ass. <laughs> so, I mean, it's just it's fantastic. And uh, when they sort of split up. And uh, Lori goes on her own to find her own date and she's like walking through the carnival and she like sees people and she's like, oh, I think I'll talk to that. And then he ends up having a girlfriend or I think I'll talk to this guy dressed up as like a barbarian. It turns out to be some like militant big lesbian or something. I mean, it's just like you can sort of put yourself in that situation of being an inexperienced person on the prowl, like you know, not quite – feeling your sexy costume and mm-hmm. not finding someone to pay attention to you. I mean, and you, you really start to feel for this character. And they, they called her and they were like, okay, give up. We've already found someone for you. It was, it was that big guy baby. in a big baby costume. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was and she's well, like, fine, I'll go. But she also knows that someone's kind of stalking her. That's little, right. You know, and that happens to be the, you know, the vampire, uh, the guy that's already killed someone in an alley as a vampire. And of course it turns out to be principal Wilkins. And let's talk about how effective that kill was. I yeah. mean, so like he's murdering this woman, in a back alley and she runs out for help and it's just like this is sort of a scream to call back right where she's being murdered right in front of people but they they think it's just a costume yep. and he's able to kill this woman and just leave her on the concrete next curb. right next to people yeah and just like walk away yep and so uh once we see that guy we know that he's bad news and when but it shows her it shows her realizing it as she's trying to escape him right and like that she's no looking, one's going to help her and she's looking at people and they have fake wounds mm-hmm. for their halloween costumes and she's right. like 
she has this realization that I'm just not going to get help. She yeah. turns around and the vampire's there staring at her, right. ready so to just oh, finish shit. the job. I mean, it was, I mean, it's, it, it's, a, it's an effective murder. Yeah. Um, and so whenever Lori catches his eye and he starts to follow her and I mean, something clicks in her head. I mean, she's like, Oh, finally someone's paying attention to me. And I had no clue that this was, uh, Principal Wilkins. Oh, I didn't either. Yeah. And, and actually, I thought he looked kind of cute. Like, I thought he was like, oh, that's kind of sexy. Like, the mask, it covers more than half of his face. Yeah. I probably wouldn't you know? have been like, okay, don't bite me. I'd have been like, uh, a little harder as Because Principal Wilkins is kind of like dopey a little bit. You mm-hmm. know, no, I don't know dopey is the right word, but, you know, kind of like. He's not somebody nerdy. that you would see doing that sort of thing. No. Right? I mean, that, that's why he's an effective serial killer anyway, because no one's going to suspect him for killing these children or murdering these women. But he's already killed all these children. He's out there killing women now, like yeah. doing the adult murdering, you know, way from his kid i wonder if it's his tradition too do you think he only kills people on halloween i mean i maybe uh he seems really because he does a lot in one damn night so i mean yeah it's like the purge for him or something (laughs) (laughs) yeah (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) he probably tells all his kids hey the kids that he hates the problem kids at school or whatever he probably says hey come by my house i love this candy yeah i'm giving out full-size candy bars yeah (laughs) uh razors in them Whenever she starts walking to the party, resigned that she's not going to find her own date. And, and of course, realizes... it's through the woods in a misty woods scene right. that's beautiful. Of course, like just like Red Riding Hood, you know. Wasn't it called like Sheep's Meadow? Yeah. Is that where it's at? I'm like, <laughs> it's a little on the nose. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> it's called Sheep's Meadow. Meet us there. We won't eat you, I swear. 233-30-D. <laughs> uh and he attacks her, right? And so when I first saw this, I was just like, shit. I was just like, this is just another story about a, a killer. I was like, this is just a slasher movie. Mm-hmm. And when his his body falls out of the tree, you think that it's Laurie and all the girls are reacting to it. And they reveal it to be the masked killer. That's when I knew whatever was going to happen after this was going to be something really fucking special. Yeah. Like, and, yeah. And, then, uh, and then, yeah, because I thought it was her too. Yeah. And then it, they, it turns out to be him. And then they unmask it. And you find not only... Only is it not her, but you also get the double shock that it's Principal Principal Wilkins. Wilkins. And then they go and like open it. She's like, he bit me. And then they open his (laughs) mouth and like rip out the fake vampire fang. She's like, oh, that was nice or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then it's a little special here because when they turn into werewolves to consume their prey or their dates or whatever you want to call them, their dinners, uh, they're literally ripping off their skin, which is not – is. I don't really remember another another werewolf movie. I'm not huge on werewolf movies, but I'm not sure I've seen another one where they're ripping. I've seen all the transformations where they're kind of morphing into the werewolf. But this is definitely folkloric where uh, there there is precedence for this where they actually are ripping off their skin and becoming their wolves under. Them. It's basically the whole wolf and sheep clothing exactly. uh, riff, you know. And well, I mean, there's movies like American Werewolf in London or movies like The Howling really feature these practical effects transformations. Yeah, the morphing this is, effects. This is a huge callback to that because mm-hmm. um, they could have easily done some CGI bullshit where they just like magically are wolves or whatever. Mm-hmm. And like just the, the, the sounds, the Foley work of them like ripping their skin off. Is that – those yeah. effects of skin, ripping the skin off was actually really good. And then mm-hmm. they do a little bit of maybe some makeup and CGI on Anna Paquin's face because she doesn't rip off her skin. I think I think it's all practical really. Like, but he, all the others are. Yeah, and the, then the wolves themselves are basically Muppets. Yeah, I know. Whenever she walks over to look at her sister and does a little head tilt, and I'm like, oh, that's touching because it's her sister. And I was like, oh, that wolf should have stayed with like half skin on because that looked, looked like better a... than the wolf. She's the, like, do it. Yeah, the only thing that looked bad was kind of like the wolves when they're fully transformed because they literally they look kind of like hand puppets. <laughs> I really wish I can go back to my first time having sex just so I can be, say, it's my first time. Bear with me. You know, <laughs> I'm just like, God, what a wasted moment. But, uh, but uh, yet again, Sam. You know, is our, watching our favorite spirit of Halloween child is uh, watching, yeah. just actually sitting on a log right there in their midst, almost as if like like they, they know like who he is or know of him or something because they're comfortable with it or they don't see him. I don't know. But he was there around the campfire sitting on a log. There's, watching. A, there's a callback to this story in the, the prior story with the children because they're in the elevator together and they hear the wolves and she goes, werewolves. Yep. Right. So everything, every callback in this movie just sort of helps you establish a timeline. Of right? course. And yeah. of course, that girl that was being murdered earlier stops our uh, husband and wife couple on the mm-hmm. street. And they're like, she's drunk. Don't help her. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Oh, my God. Uh I think 
Here's another piece of trivia too. Did you know originally when those women were dancing around the fire and peeling their skin off, he wanted to have it set to Peggy Lee's fever, like you give me fever instead oh. of Marilyn Manson. And they, they changed it later on because they thought it was a little too like tongue in cheek or whatever. Yeah. And I liked, uh, I liked, uh, you know, Sweet Dreams Are Made of These by Marilyn or, you know, the it's cover by cover, Marilyn Manson yeah. um, on that, that, on that scene. I thought it was really actually pretty effective. And there's one more callback in this story. Uh, do you know who one of those female werewolves are? No. She's Mrs. Henderson, the drunk cat lady who gave candy to the kids, the Peanuts kids. And the person that she brings to the Sheep's Meadow to kill is the coach in that hot, hot dog costume. Oh, my gosh. All you, really? Yeah. All you can see is the hot dog costume. I saw the hot dog costume. And you see I... her gloved hand, like, pulling the costume away. So she's she's a fucking werewolf. Oh, nice. I know. I mean, it's just like the small touches like that that just really make this movie something you need to watch so many times. Uh, yeah. Every single time I watch it, uh, I, I find new, something th- new. new things. Yeah. Um, uh, moving on from that is the the final story of Crouchity Mr. Krieg, mm-hmm. who is just like a Halloween Scrooge. And uh, I mean, I can't I, – I love Halloween so much. I do not want to become this kind of old person that I just – Turn off my light and not pass out candy. It's my favorite thing to do at Halloween these days. But he's got a reason. He he, you know, he has got bad memories and almost died on Halloween when he yeah. was, you know, basically contracted to kill all these special needs children by their parents. Now uh-huh. he didn't, you know, obviously we've we've discussed a little bit about this where he didn't actually do the deed. Um, right. You know, he he had still had a chance to change his mind. We'll never know. We just don't know. But uh, the, it was the Dracula kid. He was certainly that, culpable in this murder. Yeah, I was trying to escape but ended up just driving the bus off the cliff accidentally. So, But he put them in that situation. He locked them in those seats. Uh, so he's ultimately responsible. But that's not why he's in trouble here. No. He's in trouble because he, he's being an asshole to trick-or-treaters. Mm-hmm. And he's not giving them candy and he's trying to scare the shit out of them and he's just not decorated at all. Right. Sam is there. And so he's stealing their candy. He uses his dog, which has the best fucking name of him. His dog's name is Spite. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh like he's stealing these kids' his candy and eating it himself. Mm-hmm. I mean he's just a curmudgeonly Halloween Scrooge. Yep, exactly. And he gets what he deserves a little bit. Yeah. Uh, but it's such a good scene because it's it's almost reminds me the whole thing reminds like as soon as Sam, you know, like um starts doing the crawling on the ceiling stuff. You, there's oh, yeah. so many homages in this scene alone, but the whole thing is kind of a nod to John Carpenter and a couple mm-hmm. others. The character's even made to look like John Carpenter. That's right. Uh, Mr. Creek. And uh, I don't know where the dog went. Oh, the, you just hear the, the, the whimper. So you don't know what happened to the dog, but you just hear, I feel like Sam might've killed him. But, I assume the dog is dead. Yeah. Which sucks. Uh, I hate that when that happens in movies, but you know, you have to move past. I guess, oh my God, this movie is killing children left and right in animals. I mean, yeah. it's just like breaking all these horror movie rules. That's true. And it's breaking the horror movie rules, but it's making sure you damn well follow the Halloween rules. Exactly. I mean, you learn a lesson. And that's the sin that he's, uh, he's made here. And so like, he's, he's going around his house trying to like investigate all these sounds and you know, Sam, like, has written in blood, you know, trick or uh, treat, treat all over this room. And that's yeah. a creepy scene. And then later, you know, they have this whole back and forth fight, a kind of evil dead style. And he, he ends up shooting him with a shotgun, uh, Sam. Well, let's, we have to talk about the huge reveal of Sam too. So we've, we've only seen Sam in a burlap mask. And when he's attacking Krieg, he pulls the mask off and he is just like this, pumpkin this demon pumpkin yeah and, and which is a practical is... effect too like none of that was cgi and that's amazing to me oh, at this yeah. stage in the game of movie making and it really is i mean like that's how john carpenter would have done it he would have made a practical effect like that and it was super effective. yeah it was uh it was really like stan stanley winston kind of oh yeah and stuff. like when he shot the pumpkin and there's like actual pumpkin guts coming out of it i mean yeah. like it's yeah, and, and for all the audience first timers watch, they think it's just some kid that just happens to be around. You right. Know, you don't know if it's special needs or, or what uh, it is. <laughs> but obviously, you find out that this thing is more than just a kid. This thing is like demonic, or it's a, the spirit of Halloween, he's or whatever you want to say. Yeah. It, yeah, he's there for a reason. He's there to enforce. I like I like this story a lot because, um, and yet the monster, the face on the pumpkin, like it's still like the adorable like Disney I, proportions. Exactly, and it's, like, it's adorably it, cute. He's like smiley and big eyed, and I'm just like, oh. Yeah. Yeah, it's demonic, but at the same time, it's adorable. I don't know where to put my emotions. I'm confused when I look at it. But I would adopt him. I love Sam. I'll take I, it. Yeah, I, I want a doll. You know, 
They make them. But the, there's even an homage here to, of course, uh, John Carpenter's The Thing when he shoots his hand off and uh, and Sam's hand just like <laughs> goes skittering across the floor like Adam's family or something. Yeah. But it, it's an so homage to when the, the thing, the, the head gets cut off of one of the guys or and whatever and it legs. sprouts legs and crawls away yeah. and the character's like, you got to be fucking kidding. Brian Cox gives like an amazing performance in this story he's in this, this movie in general. I mean, he's, he's a very good actor. I love it when he's in horror movies. I think he was a great Hannibal Lecter. He's, he's really good in another movie called the autopsy of Jane Doe. And he's, he's a good horror actor. And this story is mostly silent. So his entire performance is just him acting the visual the, the storytelling that he makes and whatnot. I mean, like he put himself into this character for such a small part or whatnot. And I mean, it, it goes to show that the power of, of this particular filmmaker to make a movie like this, yeah, got all these big name people, it's you know? all acting and set design and atmosphere and editing. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it was all done for visual storytelling and it works really well here. I, it's one of my favorite parts of the whole movie. And it's also the payoff of the film Yeah, because once he, uh, he's finally, you know, kind of cornered by Sam and he's injured and he's like been pushed down the stairs and with, you know, and <laughs> like candy and razors, but all the candy that's fallen down the stairs or whatever, when he falls down is like hypodermic needles mm-hmm. and there's razors and there's real candy and all this stuff. And there's broken glass. And so he's like his glass all over his hands and everything. And he's finally cornered by Sam. And, uh, he, uh, one of the candies like falls on his chest or whatever. Right. And Sam like goes to stab him with the, with the broken, uh, lollipop, which he uses later as a murder weapon, obviously uh-huh. on the, on the wife and husband or whatever. I really just the wife, um, Leslie Bibb. Leslie Bibb. <laughs> and anyway, he he's actually instead of stabbing his chest, he stabs the candy bar, and and he has been given a candy bar, and he has appeased, and he essentially just leaves. And he and uh, Mr. Creed gets it, like he understands why he's he, why this happened. Right. And he goes to uh, it actually in, in between before the the doorbell rings again with new kids or whatever. You actually see in the fireplace the pictures that he had been burning. Of those uh, murdered children. Of the murdered children. So he was the bus driver. Yeah, I mean, so he must have... First of all, that picture obviously was taken on the day that he killed those kids. Why would he have it developed? I don't understand why that picture exists. Well, in the story, they said he he disappeared. So obviously, right. he, like, changed identities or something. He was or... in the same damn town. Yeah, I, mean, I know. He, it doesn't he didn't really try very hard. Sense. He didn't try very hard to change his identity, and he developed a picture of the kids that he helped murder. Or the writers, <laughs> you know... I mean, they needed it to, like, to do that. But this that really this story really is... A Christmas Carol just told at Halloween. But he's a screw who changes his mind at the end and, and he's, lives a different life. And the doorbell's ringing and he's handing out candy. And the Sam had decorated his front yard with all the jack o' lanterns. Right. And he sees Sam checking out the the husband and wife across the street. And he's like, comes full circle. Yeah, it comes full circle. And then he closes the door. And you think the movie's about to kind of end on that note, but it rings again, and he goes, and it's the zombie children coming back to exact their revenge. Exactly. And uh, so it ends very poetically, and it ends in the kind of the comic book style right. of showing like the frame where they're attacking him or whatever, and it goes back to that awesome horror score. <laughs> And then there's, you know, roll credits. And it's just such a good way to end the movie. And if you look at those comic drawings, they, like, ripped him to shreds. Yep. I mean, they really just laid into him. Yeah. But, yeah, I think it's a great way to end this movie. And I, I love the fact that when it when it comes full circle, all the stories intersect in that one block. You see the, the werewolf women driving in the car and stopping and almost hitting Rhonda. And you see the married couple arguing. And then you see, like, Principal Wilkins walking down the street or something like that. Yeah, you see almost all of them. And, uh... One thing to note, like we, we mentioned it ends on that comic book frame. Uh, the, the movie actually begins with the credits, right. you know, with, uh, with the comic book scenes kind of explaining the rules of Halloween and it just kind of introduces one character or a couple of characters from each of the stories before it goes in. And the last frame of, uh, of the, of the opening credits where it shows, uh, those comic books is actually Sam without the mask. Oh, the very really? last frame. I don't yeah. think I've noticed that. Yeah, and there's actually comic books you can buy for Trick or Treat, and mm-hmm. there's art books. Yeah, they created that. Yeah. When I first saw this movie and I saw the opening credits with the comics, I was just like, uh, because I mean, I love Creep Show so much. And I was just like, oh, they're just going to rip this off, mm-hmm. you know? And um, I'm pleasantly surprised. I'm, I'm glad they added those comics in because it really is the same th- sort of thing it, uh, anthologies um, of EC comics that were so popular back then. Well, uh, Shout Factory is going to be releasing a collector's edition Blu-ray on October 9th. 
uh, with all the extras from the previous DVD and Blu-ray releases, including some new extra content. Mm -hmm. And we're actually going to put a link to that one as well as the regular Blu-ray in the show notes, along with the, uh, the doll. Just for convenience, if anyone wants the doll for Sam, because he's adorable and I love him. I mean, I want one and I have to have that Blu-ray. Yeah. But uh, before we move on, I think we need to have some questions. Sure. Is this a horror movie, Chris? Oh, it's definitely a horror movie. Yeah. I I mean, obviously it's a horror movie based on the content. Um, I think that as other movies we've talked about, there's so much homage and tribute in this movie to past horror films. And... Um, it takes itself seriously, but not too, too much. And it just it has created his own horror movie, sort of like based and calling out to others. Yeah, it's just it's so rich. It's just jam packed with Love Letter to Halloween and the homages to other Halloween movies mm -hmm. and uh, horror movies rather. Yeah. And just uh, and so many like tropes and then subversions of tropes right. and bait and switches and call outs and twists. That is just such a fun movie. Every minute was just lovingly made. Right. And, and it is horror start to finish. Yeah. And it's like every kind of horror movie you could possibly want crammed into one movie. And I, it's fantastic to me. And it's probably going to show up on our uh, top 10 Halloween lists for uh, bonus content for Patreon content if you guys want to check that out. Oh, it'll certainly be on my list. Oh, yeah. Uh, were you scared in this movie? You know, the first time I watched it, I think it was creeped out in a number of scenes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, now it's just fun. It, it's, you know, now that we know what's happening, I'm sort of watching it for other reasons. I'm really trying to see what's going on in the background. Um, but the first time I watched it, I think I was, I was scared. I was definitely scared at the, the beginning because I, you know, you know, something's going to happen and that tension is just so delicious. Yeah. And, they take their time with some of these scenes. Like yeah. he's not just like doing this by the numbers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I've been more scared in horror movies, but it, it definitely kept me on the edge of my seat for a lot. Yeah. But this one wasn't, I don't think this was trying to be an exorcist. You know, this was trying to be a fun, right. Good time popcorn horror movie. Mm -hmm. And they do have some effective, you know, creepy stuff. Can you imagine what it would have been like to see this movie in the theater if they actually had released it theatrically? Ugh. I mean, I just, I don't, I will never understand. I hope that, I hope the studio heads who made that decision are kicking the shit out of themselves. Well, I feel like I've read about a little bit about this and it was just like there was some big releases on the Halloweens for those two years or whatever. Saw. And they didn't want to Saw compete. was coming out and they didn't want to compete with Saw. Yeah, it was like, but it was like Saw 4 or yeah, something one of stupid, stupid like that. I mean, and I know that Saw always makes money, but in comparison, I Who's mean, the executive that made that decision? Like, Someone fire his ass because this would have been. I'm sure Wilkins has beheaded him by now. Everyone, if this had opened like October 1st or something, oh you know, that year, people would have been like, see this movie, see this movie, see yeah. this movie. By October 31st, they would have been just making money hand over fist. Yeah. I, I just don't, I don't understand why this happened. I'm glad that people love it. I'm glad it has a cult following. I just, I think that the experience of watching it in the theater, not knowing what it was, would have been just magical. Yeah. So most importantly, Chris, who's the hottest guy in this movie? I think it's Tom O'Pennicott. Yeah, I I love Tom O'Pennicott from I think he's uh, Battlestar hot. Galactica, and uh, he was in Dollhouse with uh, Eliza Dushku by Joss Whedon. Mm -hmm. um, and he's been in a number of other things, but he's probably the he's probably the one. He's he was super hot in Battlestar. I think he's hot in this movie, but he's he's not my hottest guy. Oh. The hottest guy I feel in this movie is the Asian cameraman that one of the werewolf ladies pick up. <laughs> oh, He's so brief. He doesn't even say anything. But I just got a thing for Asian guys, and I think he was so fucking hot. So, I mean. Oh, well, more power to you. The next time you watch it, you have to notice those cameramen because they're very attractive. Oh, well, I, well, and I if, watched it. And if I he wouldn't have were... come with me, I would have gone straight for Tom O'Pennant. Well, I was actually doing that. I was like, are these guys like – is that like a legit? Because these girls are like really beautiful, and like, mm -hmm. would that is that? I was like, I just wanted to say mismatch. <laughs> <laughs> They're trying to get something that's easy, right, or yeah. whatever. But no, I I think that guy's super hot. Yeah. Nothing, not like paused it or anything, and like took a good hard look. But in passing, I would have I mean, he's who I would have chosen from the carnival. Well, it, it's Tom Pennicut, obviously. That's that's the one. I mean, I wouldn't kick him out of bed. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Well, guys, we really appreciate all the listens, and we hope that you've enjoyed our episodes so far. We hope that you've enjoyed our bonus content that we released last month. And don't forget that you can find that on Patreon. Yes, and we have four, count them, four more bonus episodes coming. Uh, the four bonus content episodes that we're coming out with are the top ten Halloween movies of all time. We're giving out the Brightest Flame Award for Best Horror Director. 
And we're also talking about our sequel ideas for Suspiria, which is actually really good. I'm, I'm actually really happy with both of our ideas for sequels, even though yeah. we know we're not stupid. Suspiria yeah. already has sequels and a remake coming out. However, we also have one more bonus episode, and that is discussing hot takes. Yep. We both uh, we both watched some stuff that we wanted to talk about and let you know what we thought. I saw The Nun, and he saw... Ghost stories. Ghost stories. Oh my god, thank you. Oh shit. I saw ghost stories. Uh, go over to Patreon, give us a listen. Uh, you can also find us on social media. You can find us at The Film Flamers on Twitter and Facebook. You can also go to our website at filmflamers.com where you can find all of our full episodes. And if you can't do any of those things, you can email us. What's our email address, Chris? Tiredqueens at filmflamers.com. I am tired. But we want you to join us next month when we'll be discussing the Annabelle series. Yes, Annabelle and Annabelle Creation. And we just might have a very special guest joining us in the podcast nook. We just might. So we'd also like to kind of do some call outs on some podcasts that we've been listening to that we really appreciate either the content of or the people behind them or both. So this month, we'd actually like to call out Cocktail Party Massacre because they're just just such a fun podcast with a lot of great content. They do amazing work talking about these films, and they really have a lot of games. Oh, I mean, and, yeah, it's all my favorite things are in this podcast. I like to drink, I like to play games, and I like horror movies. So, I mean, it's an amazing listen. Everyone needs to go find them. Yeah, and they do some amazing stuff uh, in, in the middle of their podcast, like just like these fake ads and stuff. And they're just a, a lot, just a good writing and good voice work. And uh, it's it's definitely worth it. So go uh, go check out Cocktail Party Massacre. And uh, we'll be giving some other recommendations throughout the coming months. So uh, stay tuned. And, you know, if you have recommendations for podcasts for us, certainly send us a message or an email. Yeah, totally. Okay. Well, Chris, I'm a tired queen. Yeah, I'm going to have to go. So ladies and gentlemen, until next time, sweet dreams. That sound gay? No, I think I'm getting a little more straight. Oh. <laughs> Ha 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 ha!